waiting for um, my cue. All right, it looks like we're live and online, so welcome everybody again to the Simbang Filipino service. Salamat sa mga maagang dumating. Thank you for those who are early. And I know a lot of people are still on their way, so um, um, I'll be praying for you as, as we open this time. Um, so, but those who are here, thank you. Those who are watching online, uh, thanks for being with us. Let me pray. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I just praise you and thank you for today. Thank you for the privilege to come together as your children to just worship you. Salamat sa lakas na binigay niyo po sa amin. Salamat sa pagkakataon na sumamba sa iyo ng sama-sama bilang magkakapatid. I commit this time to you, Lord Jesus. I pray that you just speak to all of us. Help us to really open our hearts to you um, just in worship. We want to please you and to honor you. Be with us throughout this whole day. May we bless you and may we be blessed as we come closer to you. Um, through the service today. Speak to us through the message. Speak to us through the songs. May you be blessed by what we do. Thank you, God. We commit all of this to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Our worship team will be leading us in just two songs, and then uh, we'll have announcements. Oh, there's communion. So for those at home, if you want to participate in communion later, um, you may want to prepare some bread and some juice so that you can join um, with us in doing that. All right, so I hand it over to our music team.
Truly, we want to praise and glorify our God. You may all take your seats. For now, I'll just go through a few announcements. So the usual ones are the home groups. We still have our home groups this coming Friday. We'll have a home group at uh, Kabulchur. And then, um, oh, this is this coming Friday. Yes, this coming Friday, we'll have a home group at Kabulchur. And also one at um, the Quantark Mango Hill area. That will be at our place. So I'll send more details about that. And also, um, I'd like to remind, especially the ladies, we have those um, Simbang Filipino Women's Ministry heart-to-heart -heart conversations. It, it happens via Zoom. So that's 9.30 to 10.30 a.m. every second and fourth Saturday of the month. So second and fourth Saturday of the month, it's an online Zoom gathering, 9.30 to 10.30 a.m. Heart-to-heart conversations, Filipino Women's Ministry. Um, also, 7 p.m. every Friday night, we still have the prayer time. We actually missed the last Friday. Um, but we'll resume um, this coming Friday. We're still looking for volunteers for the booth, AV and Tech, um, and also uh, Sunday setup team, and also for Friday basketball. We still haven't been able to resume that. Uh, we need volunteers. If you're watching at home, if you're interested in basketball, let me know. Um, we'll, say, we'll have our after service lunch today. Um, and as we do that, if you're interested, because we're updating the church um, prayer directory, if you're interested to update your details, especially your photo, uh, Joe is here today. And um, does anyone want to have 
to update their details in the directory. I, I will update my photo. Um, if you want, Joe it will be here. But if, if no one wants to update their photos, then she won't be here anymore. <laughs> she doesn't have to. Oh, all right. Daryl and Ray will, uh, would like to update their details. Uh, Andrew, myself. Um, anyway, um, let's talk about that during lunch. And also, actually, for lunch, we might need to um, shorten our time a little bit. The Nui um, a church had requested if they could start earlier. So we'll try to be finished by 1.30, like everything packed up by 1.30, just to give them, I think they have a special thing happening for kids today. Oh, it's not? It won't happen. It won't happen. Oh, there you go. We can stay longer now. <laughs> well, we can, we can just do our usual thing then. Um, all right, that's all for the announcement. So I will go... Um, and pray for all of us. I'll pray for the offering as well. So again, we still don't pass around offering ba baskets, but we have the box in the back, and also uh, we can give online. We, we actually prefer that, you know, being COVID safe. Um, I, I let me pray, and then I'll actually go straight into communion after this. So we have communion for today. So let me pray, and then um, we'll have a short devotion before we, we have communion. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I praise you and thank you for this morning. Thank you again for the privilege that we have to serve you. Um, thank you that you are always good to us. We receive so many blessings from you day by day. And even though we do get some difficult times, we do struggle, there is this pandemic going on, we know you are with us. And really, uh, for us here in Queensland, we are so blessed to be not so affected by COVID. But we do pray for everyone who is still struggling, um, everyone who, who might be sick or who might have been affected by the economy going down, I pray that you be with them, be close to them, and may they be drawn to you even during this difficult time. Teach us what we can do as your children to bless each other and to bless the people around us. Uh, I pray for all of the countries uh, around the world, even some parts of Australia, who is doing it much harder than us. Be with them as well, Lord God, and teach the Christians all around the world how to mobilize ourselves to be a blessing for your glory. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to give back to the offering, even a small portion of the blessings that you give us. May you give us the wisdom um, how to use whatever is collected, again, for the furtherance of your kingdom and for your glory. We thank you again for today. We praise you, Lord Jesus. All of these things we commit to you. We pray to you in Jesus' name, in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, so I will be proceeding to communion. Oh, hang on. My computer turned off, so I'll just switch it on real quick. All right. I'm back. But my computer is still asleep. Oh, there you go. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, this is the common passage that, um, that we read for our, usually for communion. The Apostle Paul reminds the disciples in Corinth of Jesus' command to every believer. He said, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you, procre you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So here, the Apostle Paul explains that we, as followers of Jesus, we participate in the Lord's Supper or communion to remember Jesus' great sacrifice for us. That Jesus, out of his great love for you and me, chose to come down from heaven to take on flesh and blood. A physical human body, he became a human, like you and me, so that he can live among us a sinless life and then ultimately give up his body and his blood by dying on the cross to serve as the only worthy sacrifice, the only payment good enough to cover for all our sins so that we can once again be reconciled to God. So 
in communion, we want to thank God. We want to praise Him for what He has done for us. But in the Bible, again, remembrance is more than just a mental exercise. It is more than just knowing or thinking about something. Biblical remembrance always involves actually living out the significance or the meaning of what is being remembered. And that is what Jesus is calling us to do when, when he commands us to remember his sacrifice. So we should appreciate and celebrate his love for us by living it out in our daily lives. And one significant way that the truth of our appreciation for Jesus' love is lived out is by telling others about what Jesus has done for us, about what we now have because of Jesus' sacrifice. Just as verse 6 says, for whatever, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In another letter, in a succeeding letter to the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 4, 10 to 14, Paul writes further, and he says, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for this uh, for Jesus' sake. So meaning even though at times we may have to deny ourselves and make sacrifices in obedience and appreciation to Jesus, we still do it. So that in his life, so that his life, Jesus' life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work, it's in us, but life is at work in you. So also uh, verse 13, it also says further, it is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have, since we have uh, that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us, uh, with, present us with you to himself. So if we truly believe in Jesus and truly appreciate his great love, that he died on the cross for us and now we have eternal life because of him, we will also want to live for him. And we will also want to share with others what he has done for us. That is what I believe, therefore I have spoken, is telling us. So communion reminds us not to just think and praise Jesus in our heads, but it challenges us to live out the gratitude and appreciation for Jesus in our everyday lives. And of course, that involves telling Jesus about, uh, telling others about what Jesus has done for us. So as we partake in communion, as we um, partake of the bread and the juice, I'll give us time, all of us, to, um, to do this. I'll be silent for just a few moments. So uh, this is so that we can all have the time to pray individually. Um, and let's think about what Jesus has done for us. And also consider, am I really appreciating this? the sacrifice that Jesus has done for me by living it out, by sharing with others what he has done for me. So uh, I'll be silent, and then um, you can pray. You, you could eat the bread whenever you're ready. Um, and at the end, I will be closing our time of prayer, and that's when we'll drink the juice together after I pray. So, all right, let's all pray now. I'll be silent for a few moments. Heavenly Father, we just like to thank you and praise you once more for your great love for us. Thank you that you love us, that you love us so much that you sent your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to go to the cross on our behalf. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus, because you willingly left heaven, you came to earth, and you even went to the cross. You sacrificed your body, your blood. You shed it for us because you love us, because you wanted to save us from our sin. Thank you because of what you've done. We now have eternal life, and only because of what you've done for us. We appreciate so much what you've done, Lord Jesus, that we now want to live our lives for you. But help us, Lord, every day because sometimes we forget. Sometimes we take you for granted and we look to other things. Forgive us for that, Lord Jesus, and help us every day to live our lives for you. Help us to speak of your love, to demonstrate your love to the people around us. Thank you that we can do it through your help now that you have changed us and you have given us your Holy Spirit. We commit ourselves to you again, Lord, and we pray all of these things with praise and thanksgiving. In your mighty name, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's drink together. With that, let's just all stand and we'll sing one song, one song before Pastor Andrew comes up to deliver the message for this morning. Oh, 
chopping off the left corner. Man, that's loud. Yeah. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's great for me to be here. It seems like only yesterday I was here. uh, And what I fear is, is that I'm going to refer to my sermon that I preached here, what to me seemed like yesterday, which for you guys is actually months ago. And so you won't even remember one thing about what I said. Uh, last time. I only remembered because of uh, the fact that I prepared to come today. So uh, I'm going to ignore all of that and I'm going to pretend that you are right there with me and everything's going to go fantastically and swimmingly. I am afraid that some of the words are going to be chopped off of our screen. I had trouble uh, adjusting the size of the screen. It's my fault. Uh, The slides I prepared were for the screen downstairs and this we use a different resolution there and so when i changed it it's sort of chewed it up here um i'm happy for you to blame me but actually the real fault lies with pj i'm going to read to us hebrews chapter 4 verse 9 to 16 and then i'm going to pray and then talk really fast for some time so then there remains a sabbath rest for the people of god for whoever has entered god's rest has also rested from his works as god rested from his works as god did from his let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's all pray. Lord, thank you for this great opportunity. And I pray that your word would come alive and that we would see you in all of your risen glory and know that you are with us. Lord, the significance of that, I pray, would be that you would reveal that to us here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, normally Saturday night at a preacher's house is a time of early sleep and getting ready for the next day. But last night, I was just so happened to be out at a Guzman and Gomez. uh, You know, every now and then you crave Mexican. I don't know if that's true for Filipinos because you have good food. Um, But there I was at a Guzman and Gomez and I saw something and I'd like to describe it to you because I believe it's something that is in epidemic proportions. Now, I thought that it was already in epidemic proportions and that it was uh, something that was impacting the young, but what I saw last night changed my whole thinking about that and that it's affecting everyone. What I'm talking about is people being distracted by these. Now, what happened, I was at Guzman and Gomez and I saw something there. I saw a middle-aged couple come in. Now, I'm going to say middle-aged because they were definitely older than me. And I observed them. They came in and I thought to myself, what's an old couple like that doing out on a Saturday night? They were all dressed up. In fact, I noticed that the wife had green 
olive green leather trousers. Like I thought, (laughs) they're middle-aged and they're going clubbing. That's how they looked to me. And they were stopping at Guzman and Gomez, which was near the city where we were, and they were going to go in there. And so I thought, here we go. Now, what they were thinking of me, I had no idea. Didn't matter. But what I saw was this. They got their, they, they got their food, and they sat down at a table and chair, and I thought, this is kind of nice. You've got a husband and a wife, I'm assuming, and they're going out on a Saturday night, And here they are spending time together, ain't love grand. And then as the food came and they were sitting there together, they both pulled these out and just sat there and scrolled through their Facebooks. They didn't say a word to each other. Not a word. Now, I thought it was an epidemic amongst the young. And then to see this older couple doing it, I thought, oh my goodness, we've got a serious problem. Now, we blame these. (laughs) We blame blame these things. It's all the phone's fault, and in some senses it is. But that problem of actually being present in a room with someone, but actually being, can I say, relationally distant, is something that can happen even without one of these. Now, on, on, on Saturdays at a preacher's house, things are often really tense. And when I had uh, a young family just a few years ago, uh, I call them now the OGs, my four original children, they would sit around on Saturday lunch and I would be there and we would have burritos, hence the connection with Guzman and Gomez. Um, we'd have burritos with refried beans and cheese and salsa, really good on a Saturday. The trouble on Saturdays at a preacher's house is usually the preacher's freaking out about what's happening on Sunday. And when I was a young pastor, I had to do uh, two sermons a week. I was also lecturing at Bible college. I also had to run a midweek Bible study. I also had to do, uh, run all the ministries of the church. And so I was busy. And so on Saturday mornings, I've got sermon ideas going in my head. And I would be sitting, I would be sitting at the Saturday lunchtime dinner table and there's yummy burritos there and I'm scoffing down my burritos. There's four children there and my wife there and every now and then it would happen occasionally. I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit how much. Every now and then my wife would have to get my attention and ask me something like, Reg... That's what she calls me. Reg, are you here? Are you with us, Reg? She'd knock on the table. Reg, are you here? And of course I was there and I would answer and say, yes, I'm here. <laughs> and then my mind would, I'd be going through the sermon in my head. You know, you know what it's like. We see it with these all the time. But it is possible for you to be physically present with someone, but so closed so relationally distant to them that even though you're physically present you're not even really there you understand what i'm talking about don't you you get that you see it with these young people they're sitting there going they're sitting right next to each other i've even seen people on buses texting each other on the bus why don't you just sit around, <laughs> sit and t- spin and talk? But we see it in older people. I saw it last night with old people and their phones. But you don't even need a phone. You can be present at home. You can be sitting there with people that you love. And they can be wanting to connect with you. But you can be so distant in your mind that you're not even really there. And they have to get your attention to get you to focus on them. And so you s- they say to you, hey, hey, hey. Where are you? Are you here? Join with us. Will you come and enter into us being here? That's what my wife used to say to me. Now, I'm talking about all of this because what I want to talk about today is the presence of God. Last time we talked about it, it's in the letter to Hebrews about God being present with us. And I just want you to understand that there's some theology around this 
Jesus said that he would send his spirit, another comforter just like him, and he would be with you forever. And so God's presence in every believer is assured for all of their life. It doesn't matter where you go, it doesn't matter what you do, his presence is the same with you all the time. But just like you can be at dinner with your wife, you can be out with your husband, you can be there with your mates, it doesn't matter how it happens, but the truth is, Jesus is physically present with you. He doesn't change. And so it must be true that you have moved. You can be so relationally distant from him that even though he's physically present, there is actually no connection between you and him at all. And Jesus has to come to us and knock on our hearts and say, hey, where are you? Are you with me? I'm here, but where are you? So listen, understand the theology that God is actually present with us all the time. He never moves, He never changes. We understand that. What happens is we move, we change. His presence is with us, but we are, we become relationally distant from Him. Preachers use language like, He may be resident, but is He your president? I think that's funny. <laughs> Another joke falls, I'll just write that down. Resident president joke doesn't work. <laughs> In Hebrews, we see the language of the Old Testament sacrificial system. The language of drawing near. And the writer to the Hebrews wants us to compare the Old Testament sacrificial system to what was achieved by Christ. And in the Old Testament sacrificial system, the high priest would enter the most holy place. And the language used is the language of drawing near. For them, the presence of God was in the Holy of Holies. And the high priest would kill some stuff um, usually multiple animals. He'd have to dress up properly in order to enter God's presence. This is when you all should be going, oh yeah, I remember this from last time. And so the high priest, in this special way, would enter God's presence. He would draw near. And the writer to the Hebrews uses this same language to describe entering God's presence. And in Hebrews chapter 10, in fact, there's four occasions where we are exhorted to do it. There's this one that I read in Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. There is, there is Hebrews 7. I won't read it for the sake of time. There is this idea, again, of drawing near to God through Jesus' sacrifice. There's Hebrews chapter 10. There's talking about comparing the sacrifices of the Old Testament to the, the coming of uh, people like you and me into God's presence through Christ. And then there is... Mm, oh, there we go. Let us draw near... Oh. Got to get, went too far. There's a big delay in the button pressing. Hebrews 10.22, that's the passage we talked about last time. There is this idea, we should draw near to God and the four things that you need, true heart, full assurance of faith, having had your heart sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and your bodies washed with pure water. Those four things were how we needed to draw near to God. But you need to get rid of this idea that there's a place where God is and you're over here and you need to go to be where He is like it is in the Old Testament system because He lives in us. And so when the writer to the Hebrews exhorts us to draw near to God, what he's talking about, he's not talking about moving spatially, going to where God is because he's here. What he's talking about is being relationally open. Is being physically present? No. Is being relationally present with God. And so if God is wanting to speak to you and you're going... 
you're not being connected to him. You get it? If you're sitting at the, ha- at the meal table and you're eating the food and not even focusing at all on the people there, you are relationally distant from them. God is right there with you. If you're not spending any attention on him, if you're not giving yourself to him, you're not relationally connected to him. You need to draw near. You need to open yourself. You need to relationally connect. Now, when I think of God's presence, I think it's a totally awesome thing. I can't imagine why anyone would not want to connect with God. Can't imagine why you wouldn't want to. It seems to me to be something that everybody should long for, and yet, in the book of Hebrews, it appears to us as a command to draw near to God and to continually draw near to God, to be open before Him. And so I want to answer the question, why would God command us to be relationally open to Him? Why would God command us to be relationally relationally open with Him? And the first, well, the reason is because there's nothing hidden. Man, do I have a problem. Are you noticing I point my clicker at the screen and then when the machine's up the back corner? There's nothing hidden. You know, the Word of God is living and active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. A sword with two edges is one that you can stab people with. If it's only got one edge, you have to slice. And so a two-edged sword, you go straight in. And it's piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. You know, the number one reason why people like you and me don't want to be relationally connected to God, even though he's physically present right here with us, is because he can see and he knows his word goes to the very core of who we are and there's stuff inside of us that we would rather he wouldn't know about and so we withdraw. We withdraw. The light of God's word exposes the immaterial, the material, the motives and the longings of every heart. Not only does nothing escape his view, but everything is laid bare before him. The facade of our lives is removed and it isn't just where it ends. Once the facade of our lives are removed, what's underneath is laid bare. It's like it's laid out on a table before God who is our judge. When I first moved to Queensland in 1988, I was a boy from Adelaide, South Australia, who had never eaten a raw mango, like peeled one and eaten one, never done it. So the Queenslanders had to teach me how to do it. The reason why you don't do it in Adelaide is because, well, back then, just a few years ago, um, they were hard to get. They were very expensive. It's not tropical enough for people to grow them down there, so they have to be imported. And so you, you just pay a fortune for a mango in Adelaide. It's not so bad now with better transport and so on, but back when I was a boy, it was something you rarely saw. Come up here, they're falling down on the road. They mango hill like I've ridden my bike and nearly fallen over because for a mango. They're, they're on the street. Just rubbish. So the, the Queenslanders had to teach me how to eat a mango. And this is how they did it. They explained it to me. You grab your mango and you grab your knife. You take your mango and hold it upright and you slice down near the middle, going as close as you can to the stone. Take off, that's one cheek. Then you turn the mango around or you if you're skilled with your knives, which you guys probably are, go down the other side of the stone, 
and take off another cheek. Now, what to do with the stony bit and the little bit, it's about a centimetre wide strip of skin and mango and then the stone. I don't know what they did with that, but they put that aside. Presumably, I, I don't know. Then they'd grab a cheek and they would use their knife and press just hard, excuse me, just hard enough to touch the skin, but not to puncture. Push in and make a slice about, depends on the size of your mouth, for me it's about an inch. Inch wide slices one way and then the same the other way in a crisscrossing pattern. Put your knife down, ah, press the back, up pop the inch squares of pure delicious mangoness and you're in. They did say to do it in the bath. I, I neglected that bit as well. That's how they taught me to eat a mango. A mango needs to be, please understand, a mango needs to be open and it also needs to be laid bare. It needs to be naked and exposed. It needs to be open and laid bare. And when the Word of God works on your life and mine, what it is doing to us, it is opening us up and laying us bare. And all that we are and all that we've done, it's as if it's like a mango that's popped open. And the natural reaction for you and for me is to run the other way. The natural reaction for you and to me is to close up. <laughs> we can't escape from God's presence. He's with us all the time. And so what happens is we become relationally distant. All right? Another thing we do is we try and reinterpret what gets exposed to somehow diminish how bad it is. And so the stuff in my life is laid out on a table before God and uh, it's obviously not always too pretty and so I say things like, you know what, this is not as bad as the other guy down the road. You should see what's on his table. You go and open him up and lay him bare and see what you see. It's not as bad as mine. Or we might say, look at this, look at this. This isn't, this isn't sin. This, these, are, these are honest mistakes. But it doesn't matter what I think of what's on my table. All that matters is, is what God thinks. And so I tell my story about my young boy, Isaac. I mean, I don't want to tell his name. Which he, he loves chocolate custard, like there in the picture. And one day we were eating at my house. When you eat a meal, everybody eats together. Everybody stays at the table until everybody's finished and then you're allowed to leave. Trying to encourage open communication it's a family time we all eat together family that eats together stays together you guys get that and so we're all there and there was one sunday one particular sunday when things had gone bad and i had given permission for everyone else in the table to leave because isaac was going slow eating his chocolate custard he was eating his chocolate custard by slapping the back of his spoon on the top of the custard getting a little bit of custard on the back of the spoon and going and licking it off. That's what he was doing and all the other kids had gone, Pauline and I, my wife, were there having our coffee and out the corner of my eye I observed our black Labrador puss was her name, that's a long story. She was sitting outside looking through a glass door longingly at Isaac's chocolate custard. 
And I was sick of it. Puss was getting sick of it. The only person not getting sick of it was Isaac, who was just slowly hitting and licking. Just a slight taste every time. And so I announced after some time, I said, Isaac, stop playing with your custard. Stop playing with it and eat it. If you don't eat it, puss will get it. You're not supposed to give chocolate to dogs. But I didn't know that then. Plus, it was a, she was a Labrador and had the appearance of never having eaten in her whole life. You know how the sad face, and even though they've just eaten? Yeah, well, that's puss. She's sitting there at the chocolate custard. And you know what Isaac said to me? He said, Dad, I'm not playing with my custard. And I got immediately angry. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean you're not playing with your custard? What, uh, what's this slap, lick, slap, lick? That's playing with it. If you wanted the custard, you'd stick your spoon in the other way. You'd scoop it up and you'd eat it. Listen, if you don't stop playing with it, the dog is going to get it. And he said, Dad, but I'm not playing with it. I'm not playing with it. And I said, well, what do you call it then? And he said, I'm savouring it. <laughs> I'm savouring it. <laughs> Out came the steam. Out came the steam. And I said, that's it, mate. You better start eating it or puss is going to get it for sure. And then he did, fortunately, start to eat it. But hear me, hear me carefully. Laid out on a table before God, as his word works in your life, he has opened you up and laid you bare. And... What he discovers there, it matters nothing what you call it. It matters nothing. It's a mistake. I didn't mean to. It was his fault. They made me do it. Oh, it doesn't matter what you think. The only thing that matters is what God thinks. And as he examines your table... It is him who is the one to whom you must give an account. It matters only what he thinks. It's no wonder that the writer to the Hebrews has to say to us, draw near, don't you run away. Look, it's all open and laid bare before God. And everything in us says, run for your life. But don't. Draw near. Be open with God. So how on earth can we approach, how can we draw near to God? And did you notice it said actually, with confidence. You know, the truth is for me that if what's on my table, if you knew half of what was on my table, I'm thankful that the only person who knows is God. Right? If, if all that we've done and thought and said, it's all the stuff, there's the stuff we've done when we were kids, there's all the stuff that we have in our thought life, everything, it's all out and laid out on the open before God. And what we want to do is recoil, what we want to do is disappear, but God says, no, draw near to me. Despite the fact that nothing's hidden, we can approach with confidence because of Jesus, our great high priest. It's what he's done, and it's also who he is. You know, the book of Hebrews says, 
that Jesus made a once and for all sacrifice for our sins, that he entered the sanctuary of heaven, having already obtained eternal redemption. There he lives forever to represent us before God. For those who have received Christ, he is eternally present as an eternal reminder that every sin has been paid for. Now, this is, I'm hoping that you can remember some of this. You and I, we can approach God because we've already been cleansed and washed. But more than that, the one who paid is in heaven before God for all time as eternal reminder that our sins have been paid for, that we have been cleansed and washed. And so as the Word of God highlights my sin, I can come to God knowing that everything on that table has been paid for and that Jesus is my advocate before God in heaven. And so I, even though I don't want to be close to God, even though I know I do not deserve to be close to God, even though I sense that it is God Himself who is pointing out the very wrongs in my life that I believe disqualify me from being close to God. He says, draw near to me, and it's all because of the great high priest who died on the cross for my sins, has completely paid for the whole lot and has washed me completely clean, that I have an eternal standing with God irrespective of what is on the table. Irrespective. You you getting all this? So that's what he's done. <laughs> Click. Oh, yo, 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 yo. Here we go. Our hearts sprinkle clean. I read, I, I've read all that before. Let's keep going. You guys know all of this stuff. That's me explaining how I've obtained eternal redemption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I want to talk next about is who he is. Another reason why you and I can come confidently and be relationally open with God is because of who he is. Jesus is, of course, the Son of God, but he's not so far aloof from us that we should shy back from him. You see, he was made like us so that he could pay the punishment for our sins, but because he was like us, like us in every way, he understands our weaknesses. He was tempted just as we are, and yet he's without sin. You know, Jesus didn't suffer every temptation possible, but rather every type of temptation, those common to us all. He suffered physical temptations of hunger. He struggled with his will when he said, not as I will, but your will be done. He said in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, Jesus understands when you approach him. And so whatever is on your table, whatever sin there is in your life, whenever you come, he, Jesus, can sympathize. His whole purpose in coming was to save us from sin and so we need not fear there need be no fear on our behalf that he'll be unwilling or unable to deal with whatever there is on our tables before God and so you and I we should come we don't physically go anywhere but we become more relationally open with God will you open your life allow yourself to connect fully with God, even with everything laid bare before Him, because the opening and laying bare is just an opportunity for God's grace to have its way in your life. It's an opportunity for your life to know the power of the blood of Christ to cleanse you. Don't run, don't hide. Don't be like me sitting at the table at my house, 
relationally distant from my family. Don't be like that middle-aged couple who are sitting there eating together, but it's as if nobody's there because they're on Facebook. Don't be like that with God. Open yourself to Him. Jesus has done everything. He understands what your issues are. So be open to Him. One more thing to say. Oh, here He is. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. What I would like you to think of just as we finish is please don't forget mercy. Don't forget mercy mercy draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need you know the truth is that our ultimate problems in life are the very things that are laid out on the table before god and it's those things, it's these very problems, it's our sinfulness that we tend to deny. And like Adam and Eve, we shy away from our own rebellion. And yet we seek to live for God in our own strength. And as we go through life, we have a whole lot of needs I have a need to love people more. I have a need for better health. I have a need for a husband or a wife. Or I have a need for a wife or a husband that loves me more. I have a need because my children are wayward and want nothing to do with God. We have a whole lot of needs in our lives. And so what our Christian life becomes is Stop talking to me about what's on the table. We put that to the side and we come to God with a whole list of needs. I need this. I need that. I need this. I need that. I need your grace to help me in my time of need. And we pray and we pray and we ask and we ask and we ask. And all the time ignore our need for mercy. And sometimes the need for mercy and, the gra and our need for grace are so linked together that it's almost embarrassing. You know, there are people, there are people who get up my nose, and I've done this, and I even do it this very day. They get right up my nose, and I say, God, I need your grace. I can't cope with that person anymore. They're giving me the heebie-jeebies. I've had it with them. I've had it. I do not love them. Will you give me your love for them? And so I think I'm some super spiritual person bringing my need for God's love for them. I think I'm some kind of great person. Ah, wow, I'm coming to Jesus to find more love for these people. And you know what God is saying? He's saying, but what's on the table? Why don't you love them? I see there's somebody who's proud. I see there's somebody who thinks that that person is just beyond my love and not as good as you. That's what I see on your table. And so when I come asking for help, asking for God's grace, what God is interested in first is that I deal with my need for mercy first. Are you hearing me? Because I know that you and I, we're exactly the same. We all fall short of the glory of God. We're all sinners just the same. And what is on our table ain't good.
but there's mercy. Oh, we come with our needs for sure. That bit we get. But let's not forget that there's mercy required as well. As God forgives, as God overlooks because of Christ what's on our table. I don't know where you're at with God, but I wonder if, I wonder if you're someone like that middle-aged couple at Guzman and Gomez. God's wanting to, to do business in your life and it's as if you're going. Maybe you're like me at lunchtime on Saturdays at my house. And you know the theology, God is right there present with you all the time. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. But as he just reveals gently and carefully some of the stuff on your table, you are distant. And he's knocking on your life. And I dare say I, it's probably happening every single day. Will you be open with me? Look, I'll take care of all of this. Jesus, the great high priest, what he's done and who he is, you don't need to worry about what's on the table. Because of our fear, we never come. We're physically present, but relationally distant. Today is an opportunity for you, as these things are very clear. Today is an opportunity for you to say, yep, I'm going to mean business with you, Jesus. I've trusted you before for the forgiveness of my sins, but I want to really trust you now. And as all that I've done and said, as everything is open and laid bare, I draw near with confidence. You know, there's only one thing that will happen if you do that. You will be forgiven. You will find mercy. And you will find grace. That's the promise of God's word. And you will be excited to find afresh the wonder of Jesus' power and his ability to forgive and to love even a sinner like you and me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your wonder. You are totally awesome. And Lord, I thank you that you have opened and laid us bare. And I thank you that that doesn't matter because Jesus is our great high priest. Lord, I pray for everyone here that you would help us to see the need of doing business with you. And this day, Lord, I pray that if there's anyone who needs to be relationally present, needs to open themselves afresh to you, Lord, I pray that you would give them the strength to do it. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good, here you go. Heavenly Father, hallelujah, hallelujah that in you we have the mercy to be forgiven for our sins, all our shortcomings, no matter what it is. Thank you that we have forgiveness in you. Thank you that we have the grace that we need from you to be able to live our lives every day according to your goodwill and your good plan for us. So we turn to you, God. We turn to you every day. Even as we go out this week, we just pray, Lord Jesus, help us to find mercy and grace in you. Help us to turn to you so that we might be able to live according to your will. I commit all of us to you again. May you bless us for another week. As we move on with our lives, bless us, Lord Jesus. We commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Amen. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And um, to everyone at home, thanks. Bye-bye.